Welcome back, mineralogy fans. It was noted previously that almost half of the elemental mass of the Earth's crust is oxygen. Silicates, carbonates, oxides, and sulfates all work together to bind the crustal oxygen into solid minerals. But it is time for us to step away from oxygen and find the minerals that form in the dark, oxygen-depleted areas of the world. Deep, uncirculating ocean basins, fjords, and lakes, or underground with anoxic groundwaters or hydrothermal deposits are the dark places where these most often occur. But when they come to the surface, many of them really shine. We will start with the sulfides, which all have the reduced sulfur negative 2 anion combining with cations in various ratios. We will start with the most common, FES2, the metallic lustered pyrite, a name which means a stone of fire for its brilliant shine, but is also known as fool's gold. Some sources would tell you that there is a particular fool involved in the name fool's gold, and it would be a she, and her name would be Queen Elizabeth I, who was fooled by a shipment of pyrite from Christopher Newport, the captain of the first Jamestown crew, into funding transport of more explorers to the English colony in the New World. Jamestown was started as a gold expedition in the first place, inspired by the Spanish gold way down south and French gold up north. My country started as a gold expedition in Virginia, predicated on frauding the English government, a fact not realized for about a hundred years, and politely erased from any history class I ever had on Jamestown. But honestly, almost one hundred years before the Jamestown ruse, pyrite was used as fool's gold by Jacques Cartier in Canada to get King Francis I to fund more expeditions. No, he, he sent quartz and called them diamonds, too. Worked like a charm. So, by precedence, King Francis I is the fool of fool's gold. But even more honestly, many people were being fooled by pyrite from the New World. Real gold was coming over, and it was hard for many to tell the difference. But don't you be a fool, and know that the cubic crystal habit of pyrite is a dead giveaway, as gold rarely produces crystals and not cubic. Gold also has a deeper yellow color than the more brassy pyrite. Gold is soft enough to scratch with your fingernail. Pyrite has a hardness of 6.5 and will scratch glass, but is still able to leave a greenish-black streak. Trust me that gold leaves a gold streak. Gold has a specific gravity of 19.3, which is way above pyrite at 5 to 5.01. But compared to most minerals at 2.7, we can sense the amount of pyrite in some samples by this almost double than usual density. Pyrite forms in all the anoxic environments named above that have a supply of iron and sulfur. One of the best ways to get such an environment is with a large input of organics. For this reason, it is not foolish to associate pyrite with petroleum. Organics and oxygen combine to become gaseous carbon forms. So petroleum requires organics in anoxic conditions to preserve and under burial grow the hydrocarbon chains. The association of pyrite and organics also means it is one of the more common and most beautiful minerals to replace organics and preserve fossils. And so pyrite forms in organic-rich rocks that also form petroleum, but you can induce pyrite formation through petroleum migrating into an iron-sulfur-rich rock environment. Some of the biggest pyrite crystals form in cavities and cement overgrowths in this way. So clearly, pyrite, the stone of fire, can be a gemstone or display mineral, and Native Americans even polish slabs of it for mirrors, but there are the more practical uses, like its association with petroleum, and in hydrothermal deposits it is associated with more valued copper, silver, gold, and platinum. Its formula lets us know it could be an iron ore, but hematite and magnetite are much more concentrated in iron, so those are the principal ores. On the sulfur anion side, though, pyrite can be used to make sulfuric acid for our chemistry labs, but sulfuric acid from pyrite also comes from mine tailings and leaks into the environment. Because pyrite is associated with the other valuable metals in hydrothermal systems, a mine dug into the earth for valuable minerals produces pyrite in the waste piles, which breaks down, making sulfuric acid runoff, which dissolves metal ions in the water. As streams run out of these mining areas and buffer, slowly raising their pH, 
decreasing their acidity, these waters begin to precipitate the most common dissolved metal, iron, in what is known as yellow boy. These shots are from downstream of a mining operation in Black Hawk County, and on the particular day I shot this, the water had a pH of 6.2. 7 is neutral, so we are talking fairly acidic water here. Because pyrite is also associated with coal deposits, it contributes sulfur when coal is burned to make acid rain. When groundwater drains from a coal mine and the associated pyrite is exposed to oxygen, it breaks down and releases sulfur as coal acid mine drainage. At least pyrite isn't as reactive as its FES2 polymorph marcasite. With the same formula as pyrite but a different crystal habit, Marcasite has similar properties, though it is slightly softer and oxidizes much more rapidly than pyrite. This marcasite nodule I found in Austin, Texas shows the more needle-like structure of marcasite crystals in a radial form here, and also shows you that in a pure form marcasite has a more silvery metallic luster, which oxidizes rather quickly to a gray rust. In fact, if you have marcasite in your collection, be careful. As it oxidizes the iron, it is releasing sulfur which combined with water will make sulfuric acid that eats away at labels or cardboard boxes that they're stored in, and they can make other samples around them smell like sulfur. Some of the less common sulfide variants are chalcopyrite, C-U-F-E-S-2, or bornite, C-U-5-F-E-S-4, also known as peacock ore, which are ores of copper. Stepping away from iron, we see that lead can also act as a cation to bind the sulfur anion into a cubic crystal habit, cubic cleavage, silver metallic luster mineral called galena. With an average specific gravity of 7.5, most geologists need only take a summary glance for that silvery luster and then pick up the sample and galena will become quickly evident by its mass. Galena has a hardness of 2.5, about the same as your fingernail. And when we say it has a cubic cleavage, we mean cleavage in three directions at right angles. It is mainly used as an ore for lead, and because galena can be a solid solution with silver, argillaceous galena is an ore for silver as well. In fact, the name galena is Latin for a lead-silver ore. Due to the low melting point of lead, Galena is one of the easiest metal ores to smelt. Stick some galena pieces in a fire pit and dig smelted lead from below the ashes when it's all done. With lead being used in batteries, galena is clearly useful, but here we not only worry about the environmental release of sulfur, but lead too, which is a toxin which can build up in organisms over time, causing metal poisoning. It's much less frightening when it's combined with sulfur as beautiful galena. The main ore of zinc is another sulfide mineral, but diverges from our pattern of metallic lusters. Sphalerite is a vitreous to resinous luster mineral associated with other sulfide minerals and is often a reddish-brown color but can be yellow, black, or even green. With a specific gravity only a little over 4, this is a less dense sulfide and it has a hardness around 4, so it won't scratch glass, but it will leave a streak which is diagnostic. It is a brownish-white streak, but that's not what's diagnostic. Once powdered, the streak plate starts emitting the smell of rotten eggs, that hydrogen sulfide smell. Besides being the main ore of zinc, it is also a pretty display mineral in some cases, though usually too soft for gemstones. The main ore of mercury is cinnabar. HGS, another non-metallic mineral that is vitreous, even adamantine in pure large crystals, or an earthy look in mixed microcrystalline form, but usually a bright red or orange color, though grays, pinks, and browns are possible. This is a mineral you want to watch for in rocks before you do a taste or bite test, things that we'll do more in later episodes. Um, I'll end today with one other less common sulfide, but personally one of my favorites. This is F-E-A-S-S, arsenopyrite, the principal ore of arsenic. So, though we want to use the taste test on our next group of minerals, the halides, don't be licking the arsenopyrite. That's just gross.